On the 26th of December 2004, the world woke up to the news that there had been a devastating subsea earthquake that caused a tsunami in the Indian Ocean. That earthquake and tsunami caused the loss of 230,000 lives, making it one of the deadliest natural disasters in history. Joining me today on the couch is Professor James Coff from the University of New South Wales. He's an expert in natural disasters with a particular interest in tsunami. Welcome to On the Couch, James. Thanks. We've had the news this morning of, uh, of a 8.3 scale yeah, yeah. earthquake causing a three metre sun wave um, in American Samoa. Tell us a little bit about that story right now as it's breaking. Yeah, well, it certainly is a breaking story. Um, as far as I'm aware, just before I came in here, we're looking at at least 40 deaths now. Now, this started off, I think it struck at about 6.40ish or something like that in the morning. Uh, and it was thought of as being, well, it's probably going to be a fairly small event looking at some of the early wave heights that were shown and it, it was quite small further away. The Cook Islands, it was only about half a metre or a metre or something. And New Zealand got one, but that was less than a metre. And everyone was starting to say, oh, well, it's probably not too bad. The odd story was filtering through, or oh, village has been knocked over, or people ran inland, or three children have been killed. And now it's just building and building. It seems to have been very, very devastating for both um, Samoa and, and, and American Samoa. And it's clearly one that uh, is, in an area of huge interest for us, uh, it also happens to be in an area where we have all these plate boundaries and, and nasty things grinding against each other where we would expect it to happen, we didn't, wouldn't, wouldn't know when, so it's extraordinarily um, significant for us to be able to go in there and look at that as soon as we can now because it's in an area of, um, which hasn't had a really bad one for some time. Mm. Uh, and we didn't think it was really bad, but now, you know, I say it's, 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 it's just building. And I think that's largely because it's been difficult getting some of the information out there. Only, there are very few sources of information out there, and it's just uh, taking time. So it's certainly generating interest uh, around the world. Now, it's fascinating to me that one story I haven't heard is about the protective effect that, uh, that legends and oral histories have for people in this part of the world, so far as tsunamis go. Yeah, certainly. I mean, one thing we found out as a result of going there and, and studying things is there were indigenous people on, on two different groups of islands, one off Indonesia, uh, one off Thailand, where they had tradition of tsunamis, what to do when a, there was a big earthquake and so on, go inland uphill. And so obviously when this large event happened, uh, they ran uphill and inland, the villages were destroyed, but all the people survived. So exactly what we should be doing today uh, and yet when you look around at all the other parts of the Indian Ocean that were affected by this, uh, very few people did do that. They kind of lost their connectivity with their environment and the understanding of the, what the traditional stories would mean. They're no longer passed on in many places. So these traditions go back some time, many millennia as I understand it. Uh, some can. Uh, certainly in Sri Lanka there was a, a, a tradition which unfortunately was not remembered but it was found out about after the event, but that goes back a couple of thousand years. Uh, a story of, of obviously an earlier event that inundated the Sri Lankan coastline. And again, it was researchers going in afterwards that found out that they'd lost that tradition. And it's now being sort of brought back to life again and being used in education in Sri Lanka, for example. So, uh, as I understand it, there's been a loss of these oral traditions in some parts of the world. Do you think that poses a, a threat to some of the communities in the tsunami um, at risk communities? Yeah, most definitely. Uh, and, and we look at that, I mean, I'm doing work in several different parts of the Pacific uh, and also around the uh, Asian region looking at uh, existing traditions, traditions that are maintained by a lot of the local people, but then we have uh, a lot of um, expats, for example, have moved into areas and many areas where people have literally, they've taken on modern society and, and sort of thrown away their traditional ways of doing things and they, in losing that tradition, they've lost those oral traditions, and so they're now living in areas where they would never have dreamed of living in before, because, oh no, you don't go there because it's dangerous because of this, that, and the other. Now, I understand that you have, uh, you've been among a group of pioneers, researchers in the last decade who've pioneered the use of uh, the recording of stories, both among uh, tsunami survivors in particular, but also the, the myths and legends that exist around tsunamis. Tell us a little bit more about that. Well, uh, yeah, very much so. Uh, it's very kindly, gradually been working our way in with a, a group of researchers from the University of Hawaii on the Big Island who are associated with the Pacific Tsunami Museum, which is archiving um, survivors' accounts. And these 
survivors accounts go a long way back in time, I think back to about 1924, and have been very active in recording those from 2004, uh, the 2006 in Java, for example, looking at the uh, 1964 in Alaska, and it's recording you know, individual sort of recollections of what happened. So you can, for example, have a 12-year-old uh, a girl talking about what happened to her, and that is a very, very, not only emotive and very difficult thing to deal with as a scientist, but from an educational point of view, you're trying to educate young children about how bad tsunamis are, what they should do, what they should be aware of. They will be far more responsive listening to the recollections of a 12-year-old than they will be listening to something like someone like me talking to them. They'll think I'll be telling them off or, or lecturing to them, whereas you know, they hear someone of their own sex and their own age group talking to them, and they're going, they will directly relate to that, and that is a very powerful message. So it's a new medium for a new age. Uh, as I understand it, the museum does have lots of archival material. There's photographs and there's documentary evidence, but this is new media. They do, uh, and it's very much a case of uh, you've got to move with the times. Uh, it, if, if we were doing this maybe 20 years ago, then we'd be, you know, have a microphone shoved in your face and it would be a recording something like that or it would be written down. But now people, if you're trying to get a message across, you've got to do it in a medium that they're happy with and they're comfortable with. So. You have it on TV as a, as a little video clip, as a public uh, service announcement, or you have it in your classrooms as a CD that you watch. Those are the kind of ways that modern society need to hear it. And again, that will move on with time. But video interviewing of tsunami survivors is hugely powerful because you're not only getting the story, you're seeing the emotion. You're actually feeling it, and some of them are devastating. So that must be a tricky thing as a researcher, because as a scientist, obviously, uh, part of your remit is to find out about the physical event itself. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, as you say, um, a, a survivor is recounting a story of devastation to them. Potentially, they've lost friends and family. How do you walk that line with someone? Um, well, in, in reality, most cases, these people have never shared their story with anybody. So for them, it's uh, one of those sort of cathartic experiences. They, they're just sharing. For them, that's a, an ex it's the start of the healing process in many ways for these people. Now, that's great for them. Uh, we're not really um, sort of infringing upon their personal life or anything. They're sharing something. They need to get this out. And the questioning in such a way or an interview like that is very open. You just let them go with it, and they just start talking. And what could be, let's say, a 10-minute video interview may end up being two hours instead because the people just keep talking and you just fill in some details at the end with some very pointed questions or, or, or very specific questions so in doing that you're really finding out their true feelings they're not giving you a reply that they think you want to hear they're giving you their story uh, it's very tough to handle though I mean, for them it's tough to handle in many cases because it's the first time they've talked about it and for the scientists, we're not just doing one interview. We normally go to an area, we, we may be there for a week, we may be there for two weeks, uh, and you're doing maybe anything between sort of one of these, two of these, so up to eight a day, even more, and that gets pretty brutal, to be honest. So you have uh, set up some protocols for this kind of video interviewing with tsunami survivors. What are some of the key points, just a few? Well, I think this is, this is work, and again, it's, it's not just me, it's very much a, a team effort, and we're very much uh, partners with the, the people in Hawaii. Uh, there are things, you've got to get people comfortable. You can't just sit them down, if, if, you're, if they're telling a story that's extremely emotional and things, you don't sit them down in the middle, right next door to a highway, for example, with cars going by, very distracting. They have to be comfortable with where they're sitting. Uh, you also need someone to interview them who speaks their dialect, understands what they're saying, can ask questions and, and interact with them in their own language, they can translate it later. And that's a, a fairly significant effort in itself. Um, and there are a whole series of things like that. You know, you want to try and make it as comfortable for the person who's being interviewed, but from a scientific point of view, you want to be getting as much information as possible. So it's a delicate balance and there are these protocols. You know, we have someone who assesses who the best people are to interview in a, in a general way. And that's someone, again, who speaks the language, who knows the people who are affected, knows the area, uh, may be able to go to, this is exactly the person you need to talk to. They have a very significant story to tell. And so that's another point. If, for example, they can say, I ran inland and uphill. I was scared stiff. I didn't know what to do, didn't talk to anybody, I just ran. That's a very nice, neat little story because it is saying the one thing that everyone needs to hear, go inland and uphill. 
So I've seen some of the, the video interviews that you've done uh, also with uh, Professor Walter Dudley mm -hmm. at the University of Hawaii. Um, wh what is it that strikes you most about survivor accounts? I think their resilience, absolutely staggering. They, these people have had their lives ripped away from them, completely out by surprise. They, they weren't expecting it at all. They've had their families taken from them. They've absolutely nothing left at all. And here you are talking to them maybe a month later, maybe two years later, or, or whatever. They've got on with their lives. They've rebuilt things. They've kept on going. And it's not a case of, of, of saying, oh, well, you know, it was tough and so on and so forth. They've just done it. And you have huge respect for these people. Incredible. Uh, and in many cases, I say, they haven't actually shared it before. So they've done this all with this whole story bottled up inside them. Um, and you do get that feeling of, well, you know, we could actually do a lot better for these people after an event like that. So how can we do better? How is that kind of material brought back to them, in a sense? Is it through the internet? Is it through local media? How can that material benefit the communities who are providing it, in a sense? There are many ways that it's been done. We've been talking about this as recently as, as yesterday, about new ways of getting this information out to people. But, for example, uh, having public service announcements on TV. So you, you, you can run a little piece of one of the videos and then use that as frame uh, information of education for communities around that. You can produce CDs because all each of these, not each of them, but very key interviews get cut down and edited down to very usable, let's say 30 seconds, two minutes, five minutes, whatever the key story is, everyone has a, a very important part in their, in their video interview that, that can be used. And those can go into different curriculum. You know, you can, you can put them into uh, a junior school, you can put them into teaching high school children. You can use it in university courses. You can use it as part of emergency management material that goes out to individual communities. Mm -hmm. There are many ways of, of using it. It doesn't even have to be just in that video form. It can be transcribed, you know, little quotes from people and things like this. Ultimately, the important thing is to have the information. And then every, almost every state, every community, certainly every country is different in the way you get that information across and how you can use it. But the important thing is to have it in the first place and then engage with emergency service people. Engage, engage with the media is very important. You know, today we're talking at a time we've just had the Samoan you know, earthquake and tsunami. Very, very significant. Now, there's an opportunity there where, for example, the media may say, well, we need more information about, slot that information in. It creates a wonderful educational opportunity to use that type of video clip information. So finally, uh, um, the 2004 event, mm. which was the big one, um, in a sense seems to have woken everybody up to earthquakes and the potential for tsunami. Are there more than seems usual at the moment? It just seems that every, every couple of months we, we're hearing about tsunamis. Are we living through a, a hot spot or a purple patch? Um, I don't think so. It's more a case of, I, uh, I think in the big picture of things, the media is more aware. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I'm probably slightly cynical there because, the, the, you know, if, if we'd had 2004 and then nothing until now, it probably wouldn't have been quite as significant an mm -hmm. event. Uh, but we've had the 2006, we've had the 2007. These things have been happening and firing off all the time. Uh, realistically, I think it was the 2004 that put this thing on the world agenda. And as long as we keep firing... They, they keep firing off at the regularity of, you know, couple, one, every year, every couple of years. We do get one that's big enough to kill people somewhere in the world, and it's bad enough to be pretty damaging. It's always been doing that. We just had the 2004, which kind of raised the bar, and everyone suddenly realises that these things are happening. You know, we had the 92, we had the 98. We had a lot of ones before, um, but they didn't really come up on the radar screen, anything, mu anything like they're coming up now. Professor James Goff, it's been illuminating. Thank you for joining us on the couch. Hey, no problem at all. Thank you.